Hello everyone. Today's lecture will be covering the mid-1930s, in particular the Italian invasion of Ethiopia and the Spanish Civil War. These wars, as well as being bloody and costly in their own right, greatly raised the tensions in Europe and made World War seem imminent. In fact, for many people in Africa and Europe, the wars represented the beginning of the Second World War, and it is in this context that we shall consider them today. Ethiopia was an empire in its own right, but was most notable in the 1930s for being one of the two remaining independent African states, alongside Liberia in West Africa. In the 1890s, the Ethiopians had utterly crushed a poorly organised Italian invading army at the Battle of Adwa, and since then the Italians had been forced to remain in their colonies in today's Eritrea and Somalia. In the meantime, the export of coffee to western markets made Ethiopia rich. In the 1920s, Ethiopia's heir to the throne, Rastafari, engineered the country's ascension to the League of Nations, an organisation formed after World War I and run in a similar fashion to the modern UN. As well as this, the prince also improved communications within his country. Foreign businessmen were allowed into Ethiopia, but the economy and the state remained closely in Ethiopian hands. Rastafari declared himself emperor in April 1930, taking the name Haile Selassie. The new emperor used his country's coffee exports to build roads, schools and hospitals. Communications and administration were greatly expanded. Mussolini, looking to expand the Italian colonial empire for reasons of personal and national glory, viewed these developments with mistrust and made plans for an invasion. The Ethiopian defence plans were hindered by the emperor's trust in the League of Nations, which he felt would deter an Italian invasion or provide support in case the worst case scenario happened. The League of Nations was, however, dominated by imperialist Britain and France, neither of whom particularly cared about Ethiopia being annexed, although the British government certainly resented Italy's colonial expansion at its own expense. In the end, the Italians were to receive sanctions from the League, but nothing else. The Italians invaded Ethiopia on October 3rd, 1935, making slow but steady progress against an army that still lacked much modern equipment and vitally training. The invasion was closely followed and condemned by the public in Britain, France and the US, with Caribbean and African Brits and French being particularly outraged at the treatment of Ethiopia. On the 8th of December 1935, with sanctions having been unable to prevent the Italian advance, British Foreign Secretary Samuel Hoare discussed with the French Prime Minister and future fascist Pierre Laval ways to end the war. On December 9th, British newspapers revealed leaked details of an agreement between the two men to give much of Ethiopia to Italy to end the war. British public opinion, even on the conservative right, was outraged by this blatant example of imperialism and greed and forced Hall to resign. In France, socialist Leon Blum attacked Laval, telling him, you have debased everything by fixing intrigue and slickness. The plan was hastily withdrawn. The war continued, and now Italy used poison gas on Ethiopian troops who had no gas masks. Desperate Ethiopian counterattacks resulted in casualties ten times higher than the enemies, and the emperor himself saw the mangled, gassed bodies of his countrymen whilst conducting the offensive at the front. The Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa, became clogged with refugees, making effective defence impossible. The Italians took the city on May the 5th, effectively ending the war. Emperor Haile Selassie went into exile, first to London, and then to the provincial English town of Bath. 
At first he was greeted by sympathetic crowds, but soon his cause was neglected by everyone except black British residents. In Rome, Mussolini proclaimed Itali Italy's king, Victor Emmanuel III, as the new emperor. The war had damaged the reputation of both the League of Nations and Britain and France. Stalin's Soviet Union also came out looking bad, as it had continued to supply Italy with resources, even as the rest of the world boycotted the country. This lost Stalin the support of many black revolutionaries in both Europe and North America. By and large, however, the world's attention had now turned to Spain. We last discussed Spain in the context of the Carlist Wars, and indeed the country had only been peripheral to major events since then. In the 1890s, it had lost Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines in a disastrous war with the United States, which was busy building it up its own overseas empire. In 1931, the Spanish king, Alfonso XIII, left his recession-hit country following the collapse of a dictatorship that he had supported. A republic was declared, particularly popular in the country's largest cities, Madrid and Barcelona. From the very beginning, the republic was torn by strife between different factions of socialists, radicals, liberals, Catholics, monarchists and fascists, as well as a few remaining Carlists. As well as this, parts of Spain, in particular wealthy industrialised Catalonia in the northeast, began agitating for independence. When, in 1934, a conservative, even fascist, faction, the Spanish Confederation of the Autonomous Right, joined the Republican government, the left, both leftist liberals and socialists, launched a series of strikes and uprisings known as the Revolution of 1934. The centre of this revolution was the mining region of Asturias in northern Spain, where rebels, using secret caches of weapons that they had stashed, took over the city of Oviedo, as well as the surrounding countryside. Once in power, these rebels declared a proletarian revolution, and took such extraordinary steps as banning money in the region they controlled. The army brutally crushed the uprising, but memories of it remained, and the defeated socialists and leftist liberals formed a so-called Popular Front, that narrowly gained power in elections in February 1936. The Popular Front government was formed of liberals in favour of republican government, with the socialists only offering support from the sidelines. From the beginning, the socialists put increasing pressure on the government, using revolutionary language, if not themselves intending revolution, and agricultural workers in the south and west used this rhetoric to stage a number of land seizures against their landlords, the families of whom had often owned the land for centuries. The leading socialist, trade unionist Largo Caballero, Caballero praised the, Repu the Republic in public, whilst in secret preparing for a pure socialist government, which his followers chose to call the dictatorship of the proletariat. The political right argued that the Republican government was a prisoner of the revolutionary left. The Falange, a fascist party founded in 1933, grew significantly. The Falange was primarily responsible for the increase in political street violence in the months after the 1936 election. Conservatives rallied behind the right-wing National Front, which openly appealed to the military to save Spain from Marxism. The army became increasingly disloyal to the Republic, and it quickly became apparent that it held the balance of power in Spain. The Spanish army was large, with over 500,000 men under arms and with an extensive officer class. It was also experienced, having fought, an ex having fought a colonial war, the Rif War, in northern Morocco in the 1920s. An army-led coup had also toppled the Republic in neighbouring Portugal in 1926. By the early summer of 1936, 
a young officer's conspiracy was backed by Generals Emilio Mola, Manuel Godet, and finally Francisco Franco. Franco was the chief of the army's general staff and had shot to national prominence through his suppression of the Asturian Miners' Rebellion. On the dawn of July 18, 1936, Franco's manifesto beginning the military rebellion was broadcast from the Canary Islands and the same month and the same morning the rising began on the mainland. The following day, Franco flew to Morocco and with and within 24 hours was firmly in control of the colony and its army. Whilst garrisons throughout Spain joined the rebellion, they only succeeded in seizing about half of the country. Galicia in the north and Andalusia in the south fell to the military, who became known as the Nationalists. The Nationalists also seized control of the Basque region of Navarra, with the help of residual Carlist sympathisers, as well as the ancient city of Zaragoza. Everywhere else, including Madrid and Barcelona, stayed loyal to the Republic. In the large cities, the Republic's government armed the workers with weapons to defeat the revolting soldiers. In Barcelona and the rest of Catalonia, extensive offers of autonomy were made to win the loyalty of the locals. The Republican areas of Spain held the country's industry. The nationalist areas, however, were where most of the food was grown. Although the Republic's government remained just about functioning, real power in the Republic areas of Spain lay in the hands of workers' councils and the trade unions. A workers' militia took over the role of the rebellious army. Factories and farms throughout what remained of the Republic were collectivised by agricultural labourers. The level of revolution occurring, however, brought serious conflicts and fractures within the Republican side to light, as different factions made themselves known. On one side, there was the increasingly desperate Republic government of the left liberals, who appealed in vain to Britain and France, but were rejected out of hand by the two countries who didn't want to get involved. This government was supported by the Stalinist Communist Party of Spain, which grew very powerful due to its control on arms and ammunition arriving from the Soviet Union. In the name of an efficient war effort, the communists called for an extensive central government, and this meant working with the liberals. The government was opposed by the Trotskyist party, PUM, which rejected the Popular Front in favour of a workers' government. There was also the Trade Union Federation, the CNT, which advocated for workers' control of the factories without any state oversight. This is called anarcho-syndicalism. National nationalist Spain was a great deal simpler, with the military running everything. An extensive terror was operated by the military, in which everyone accused of being a red was executed, the number of those killed likely reaching over 100,000. On October 1st, 1936, Franco was formally recognised as dictator by the National Defence Council. In April 1937, he assumed control of the Falange, merging it with the Carlist factions under the so-called National Movement. The Catholic Church took the side of the rebel government and defined the religious Spaniards who had been persecuted in the Republic areas as martyrs of the faith. The papacy considered Franco's uprising to be a crusade against godlessness and was the first entity in the world to recognise nationalist Spain in 1938. As we discussed earlier, the British and French governments gave no support to the Spanish Republic, not even supplying it with any weapons. The popular government in France were terrified of a conservative backlash, and the British government saw little way that they could gain from intervening. The people in both countries, however, were outraged and signed up to fight in so-called international brigades, where they were joined by volunteers from all over the world, including including from the US and Germany. 
These volunteers were vital in defending Madrid during the first year of the war as nationalists advanced on the capital. Franco, however, was able to gain the support of Italy and Germany, both of whom supplied him with men, but vitally with air power. Guernica was not the only Spanish town to be bombed in 1937 and 38. The Soviet Union sent tanks and aircraft of their own to help the desperate Republic, which proved vital as the Republican side just about held on. The workers' councils and unions had presumed that their militias would fight just as well, if not better, than their military opponents. This was not the case, however, as enthusiasm could not make up for the chaos of running an army by committee. The communists pressured the republic into replacing the, milita into replacing the militia with a popular army, which got organised enough to hold Madrid again in 1937, once more with the help of the international brigades, who destroyed an Italian motorised corps at Guadalajara in March. In May, however, disaster struck when Poom launched an uprising behind the front lines in Barcelona. This was crushed, along with anarchist opposition, and from now on the Soviets effectively ran the Republic. By 1938, Stalin had considered Spain a lost cause, and massively dropped off the supply of arms to the country. Spain's extensive gold reserves, meanwhile, somehow found their way to Moscow. By 1939, the Republican side had grown desperate and hungry. The international brigades were evacuated from Valencia to great applause, but in much sorrow. In Madrid, the leftist liberals and the communists finally turned on each other, fighting over scraps in the starving city as nationalist troops entered in March 1939. The civil war had been largely a brutal struggle of attrition, marked by civilian atrocities. The tens of thousands of executions carried out by the nationalist regime, which continued during the first years after the war ended, earned Franco more reproach than any other single aspect of his rule. The left throughout Europe was bitterly divided by the war. Who was to blame? Was it Stalin? The anarchists? One certain thing was that Britain and France had failed to protect one of Europe's last remaining democracies. They were now left facing a triumphant Italy and a resurgent Germany, whose invasion of Poland in September would herald the beginning of the Second World War on the continent. <laughs>